Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Paul Dahl. I lead product management in VMware's cloud native applications business unit. And we're here today with, uh, with users of PKS, and we're hoping to have a lively uh, discussion, hopefully some key takeaways for you to, to go ahead and think about as you uh, are participating in the rest of the event over here and to take home with you. Um, and at the end, we'll save some time for Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, you know, feel free to queue up at the microphones toward the end of the conversation and, uh, and uh, participate. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. So we have uh, Jeff Levy. Jeff is VP of Cloud Platforms at Priority Payment Systems in Alpharetta, Georgia. And there he currently leads a team focusing on software-defined data center ranging from virtualization, compute, storage, end user computing to database operations. Next, we have Stefan Massault. Stefan is Vice President Innovation at Swisscom Labs in Men uh, Menlo Park, California. He's responsible for Swisscom's cloud innovation in Silicon Valley, focusing on technology scouting, technology assessment, and managing the partner ecosystem for Swisscom's cloud. And lastly, we have Nesta Campbell. Nesta is Senior Systems Administrator at NCV Financial Group in Jamaica. He and his team are responsible for compute and storage and SDN infrastructure. His current focus is on building a reliable platform for rapidly deploying applications and microservices to support their digital transformation initiatives. So, guys, thank you for coming here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you, you know, how did you, how did you get here? You know, how did you get to this container journey? What drove it? You know, was it uh, the developers asking for containers in Kubernetes? Was it C-level uh, executives asking for it? So, you know, what brought this transformation uh, to be? Jeff, you want to start? Absolutely. So for us, I think it was uh, it was a combination of some of our lead developers, um, our uh, CTO, um, really understanding the the current traditional architecture that we were on um, and understanding where we wanted to go from a business standpoint, um, being able to bring product to market a lot faster um, with more agility, being able to um, sort of separate the monolithic application into, into a bunch of microservices. Um, you know, we were uh, leveraging a lot of .NET SQL backend technologies, um, so we really we really saw the need to go to more of a microservices uh, big data architecture. Okay, all right. Um, Nesta, how about you? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so as you mentioned, I'm from National Commercial Bank Jamaica. We're one of we're the biggest um, bank in commercial bank in Jamaica, and we have a strategic objective of ensuring that majority of, majority of our customers' um, full, fulfillment is done digitally. And, and, and this is driven by? This, so we're, well, we're growing rapidly, and, and we also want to own the touch points of our customers. And we found that this would require us to build majority of our applications in-house. And the traditional method of um, waterfall method that we're using just wouldn't cut it. So instead of delivering an application in six to 12 months, we require that it be delivered in three to six months. And so we started using Agile, um, spinning up some Scrum teams and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the, when we started, we were using tradi the traditional method of um, spinning up some VMs and handing off to the teams, and we said that just wasn't working. So we started looking for a platform and even though we had on our roadmap to look at containers, our hands were forced by the fact that we had all these teams that were just coming and demanding more and more from us. So we started looking at um, Cloud Foundry initially, but we found that it was a little bit too restrictive for our environment. Yep. And um, it was worked, Cloud, Cloud Foundry. Yes. Yep. And Working with VMware, the VMware um, team, we eventually ended up at Kubernetes and more specifically PKS. Okay, all right. So in this kind of journey to, uh, to digital transformation, 
you found that uh, VMs you know, were, were not sufficient. You, the developers really wanted a platform. Yeah, and this I, is to manage the complexity, right? Because you're building distributed applications now and you need to orchestrate across microservices. Yes, yeah, so complexity and the would just the support, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to deliver what was needed by the teams fast enough. Okay. Yeah, so we needed something that we could automate and um, orchestrate. <laughs> okay. That easy, yeah, yeah the, the orchestration burden when you're moving to cloud native applications yeah. really goes up pretty significantly and it's pretty key to have a platform to help you to manage that. Yes. Okay. Stefan? Yeah, in our case, we started more than five years ago now with, with using Cloud Foundry. Um, mm -hmm. And because it was actually one of the first container platforms that we felt comfortable with using. And, and I share your point, it's very prescriptive, it's, it's very opinionated on how you build your applications. And, and that's when um, we saw the rise of Kubernetes and the um, Cloud Foundry container runtime coming to the, to the table. It was a very natural transition for us to say, let's, let's move into um, and using Kubernetes and, and containers on that level. Um, the whole drive is the same. I mean, we need to be more agile. Um, I think Pat very nicely stated that the telco business is one of the you know, least virtualized businesses. That's definitely true, by the way, for the telco business, but all the surrounding IT systems also have that problem. And, so where we started five years ago is more or less starting all the surrounding IT systems and containerizing them, or building containerized frontends, mobile backends, all these kind of things on these technologies. Um, and now we're seeing that we're hitting a couple of applications that are simply not yet there to be containerized in a Cloud Foundry format, but might be beneficial, benefiting from using containers in a different way. Um, and it's interesting to see that most of our suppliers are also now on that on that journey and they're delivering software solutions there. So. It is a combination of a business driver where the business want to be faster, that's, that's a key driver, mm -hmm. but also the fact that the tooling and uh, the developers are getting more and more aware of how to do this, how to use cloud native principles. Yep. So it, it, it comes from both ways. Okay, all right. So big, big users of Cloud Foundry, very active in the Cloud Foundry Foundation, yep. and PKS is a way, and Kubernetes more broadly is a way that you can go ahead and expand the number of workloads that can be addressed by, by a platform. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we see definitely see the two living side by side right now, um, each having their own you know, specific possibilities and opportunities. Okay, all right, great. So um, let's, uh, I'd like to take a, a little quick poll of, of the audience, if, if you will. So um, how many folks here consider themselves to be developers or DevOps? Okay, got, got a few, that's good. Welcome, glad to have you here. And uh, VI admins? Okay, get a few of those. And uh, okay, and so other just broadly IT is that? Yeah. Okay, well, we've got a l little bit of everything. I think some we've got some holdouts over here. Some people not voting, but that's all right. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to know how many folks uh, are running Kubernetes actively right now. You've got production workloads running on Kubernetes. Okay, so it looks like about a dozen or so. Well, we got more over here, maybe. Yeah, 12, 15. All right, how many are actively engaged in a trial of Kubernetes of, of one sort or another? All right, looks like you know, about twice as many, maybe you know, 20, 20, 25. All right, and then how many of you here are here to get smarter and learn about containers and Kubernetes because you've heard a lot about it and you just really need to, all right, that's good. All right, we're glad you're here. So hopefully we'll make you a little bit smarter and take you home with, with, with a little bit of, bit of knowledge. So first, let's talk about the types of applications. So you know, what, what types of applications are you targeting uh, for, to land on Kubernetes? Are you taking traditional applications and re-architecting them? Are you starting uh, Greenfield with new applications? Um, is it based on you know, uh, uh, market demands in terms of you know, having really scalable, resilient apps? So what, what's kind of driving that selection process? So I think for us, it's, it's a combination of, of all those. So we're taking all of our um, existing applications, our, our production applications that uh, both our internal users are consuming and also our external users are consuming, and we're, we're essentially re-architecting those applications to run um, as microservices within, within Kubernetes. Um, and I wanted to add something that I, I didn't mention before. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been running containers now for about two and a half years. Our, our, um, our first attempt was utilizing um, a couple of HashiCorp products called Nomad and Consult. Um, so we really saw the need to 
have more of an enterprise grade um, container solution in place. So we, we migrated all the workloads over to, uh, over to Kubernetes. Um, but um, back to the question though is that, so we're refactoring all of our current applications to, to run um, as microservices, but the other thing that we, that we really saw was the ability to uh, provide more features and benefits within the application by um, by utilizing this new uh, this new architecture that we have we have in place with uh, with containers and and the big data platforms. Okay, so it's really about providing end user functionality. Um, is that right? That well, yeah. So it's it, number one. Uh, you know, we saw the need to that we needed to to be more agile and be able to um, provide whether it's hot fixes. Uh, new features, we, we move very rapidly within our environment um, and we needed that platform to, to be able to do that and we saw containers yep. um, as, the, as, as the method to, to do that. Okay, so that ties into the application agility that, that Nesta yep. was talking about earlier. So Jeff, you actually have uh, production Kubernetes clusters mm -hmm. and have had for some time based on open source Kubernetes, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And now Jeff and his team are actively evaluating PKS and have had uh, POC and uh, lots of hands on, on time with it. So what are some of the, for you, what are some of the, the, the main advantages to having, you know, having been through that, hey, I did it myself approach, uh, what are the, some of the, the things that pop to your mind in terms of uh, advantages to having a package solution, if you will? So number one, it's, uh, you know, fully supported by VMware. Um, you know, currently we, we have a lot of uh, smart people um, in the company that are able to support the product. Um, the other thing is that we're, we're utilizing Weave as, as the overlay mm -hmm. network for containers. So we also run NSXV um, and there's, a, you know, they both run VXLANs. So there's a bit of uh, some issues sometimes. Um, so the whole PKS solution, um, you know, is really is really enticing. You know, number one from the support perspective, but number two from the installation, configuration, deployment of it, and the the ease of use um, by the the engineering team, um, being able to hand off um, you know the credentials over to your platform team to that manage the the Kubernetes clusters. Um, and then just giving the developers, you know, the, the Kubernetes API to deploy out their, you yeah. know, the workloads to it. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, the, other, the other piece is the networking piece, uh, fully integrated with NSXT. Um, you know, that's uh, with us being very secure by default within our environment, um, you know, we have, we have micro segmentation in place already. Um, one of the challenges that we have in our current environment is because we can't do micro segmentation at the container level, we're doing it at the virtual machine level, so we have to have these groups of VMs that we're deploying containers out to that have uh, similar network policies. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, PKS and NSXT provide the uh, operational efficiencies with being directly connected into NSXT, um, any kind of uh, you know clusters that you that you deploy out, namespaces, um, all of the uh, policies and routing and switching automatically get created with NS NSXT, and that provides us with the ability just to have one large pool of worker nodes to deploy our microservices out to and, and then we just use the, the, the firewalling to segment the, uh, the uh, container workloads. Right, so you deploy a cluster, you automatically get your own network segment, you get a load balancer for that cluster, you create a service and you yep. get a virtual In server set up and configured and... Ingress, all, all ingress all controllers, right. yeah. Right. Okay, so we're digressing a little bit, but we're talking about application types. <laughs> You're re-architecting uh, a number of applications to, to run on Kubernetes. Uh, Stefan, what, what are you seeing in your environment in terms of what, what are the initial targets in terms of applications that you're going after? 
So when we started, it was pretty much non-mission critical applications, um, sure. room reservations. Uh, we had all the applications for that based on Microsoft.net, um, just not the best solution, and it was not scalable. Um, completely re rewritten, rearchitected, and, um, and and that was based on, of course, containers to scale up. Because usually Monday morning, you see a load of everybody trying to meet, book their meetings and stuff like that. Um, now we're moving forward on mobile apps, mobile backends. Um, Swisscom has a service called MyCloud, which allows you to store your photos that you take um, and, and, and watch them on your TV box, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that is now completely refactored and built um, on cloud native principles. Um, and machine learning AI applications, they're already running on Kubernetes. Um, those are the typical ones, the newer applications that we take have been taken first. Um, a lot of our, what we call in, in telco terminology, BSS and OSS, so that the operational systems to run your telco network and the administrative system supervision, um, they're simply too legacy to, to pick up and, and refactor because you have so many dependencies. So this is where we're trying to work together with our suppliers and get them to run it. And then they will usually run it on a container image basis. Mm -hmm. And there we see that Kubernetes is the easiest way to get this, do, uh, get this going. We typically do not develop that software ourselves because it's, it's very specific and it requires a lot of know-how. Um, so where we develop it, it's more the front ends towards the customer, the websites, mm -hmm. mobile apps, these kind of environments. And, and they um, are very well suited to run on any, kind, any type of container environment. Okay, so it's uh, it sounds like a, a fair bit of refactoring, but the f uh, yeah. but focused on front end applications, and so it's yeah, easier to make the front end stateless yeah. and uh, be able to, uh, to to manage them in that way, right? And, and that is also the part where we have our customer touch point. And mm -hmm. as Nessa was saying for us as well, owning that customer uh, interaction is key. We we want to be in control of customer service processes, so yeah, you know, there it actually creates value to be able to do this yourself and make sure that that experience is tailored to the specific. Um, you know, country needs. I mean, Switzerland has four different languages. Um, you know, there are a lot of specific tweaks and things you want to do there. Yeah. And the way you want to present uh, your product. So this is where we want to be in control. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good point in terms of you know applications more and more really being the way that uh, companies interact with their customers, right? Forming customer relationships, uh, driving revenue in, in many cases, brand identity being expressed through, through applications. And uh, you know, hearing more and more that applications really are a source of competitive advantage. And as a result of that, application development really starts to become a core competency within en enterprises. Yeah. And it sounds like that's similar for NCB, right? I mean, mostly Greenfield though. Yes, um, yeah. completely new. Um, we're currently testing the mobile bucket, the backend for a mobile app. And um, we'll be moving some like Spring Boot applications eventually to it. We'll also be using it as the, we will run the API for our backend services. So okay. as you can imagine, we have a lot of traditional applications. Mm -hmm. So we'll be placing these APIs on the Kubernetes platform. Okay. Well. Yeah. yeah, Kubernetes uh, you know, has a lot of flexibility in terms of you know, when you're re-architecting uh, re applications. Uh, with the ability to uh, support stateful sets. And so, you know, previously a lot of the PaaS platforms required that applications would be stateless. Um, that's no, no longer a requirement. So are you looking at maintaining state within the applications or right now is the focus more on, on stateless kind of front, the front ends? Not, not um, right now. Eventually, okay. but we want to get the front end working first before okay. we think about the bucket. Yeah, that seems like a, a, a reasonable and conservative uh, approach for a financial organization. Yeah, eventually, so. we want to put all our new um, deployments on PKS. So when it's more stable the, um, for the stateful sets and support, we'll use that. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. So, you know, one of, uh, one of the, the ways that you can isolate either um, applications or lines of businesses or tenants uh, are through independent clusters. And so I'd be curious to hear from, from each of you, you know, what's your plan for, for clusters? Uh, are you planning on rolling out lots of clusters? Are you one large cluster that you break up with namespaces? What are your thoughts around that? Stefan? Yeah, uh, in our case, we're a service provider. So what we build as a platform um, is, is not only for internal use, but we also sell this to our customers. And a lot of them are financial institutions in Switzerland. We are pretty known for that. And, and due to the high, let's say, security requirements that these customers have today, we, we have seen that just separation on namespace, even though there are solutions in the market that claim they can do it, is simply not safe enough. 
Not um, safe enough. It's not safe enough. There are still a lot of issues that you will have, uh, and especially when you're working with Kubernetes and Docker, uh, most developers, and there are not that many in the room, so I can be a little bit harsh on them. Uh, <laughs> You know, they prefer just to have root access for application. They're a little bit lazy if it comes to enforcing these kind of things. Um, you, end, you end up with running your containers in privileged state. As soon as you run one container in privileged mode on your node, your node is contaminated. You mm -hmm. cannot use it for another customer anymore without, you know, if you want to guarantee certain isolation and security. And of course, there are solutions for that, but if you really want to scale, um, scale up, we have said we want to create multi-tenancy based on a cluster level. So we will deploy clusters per customer, either internal and external. Um, and, and this is part of the reason why we're also looking for an, 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 you know, a way to manage clusters very easily, because um, especially in, in the lab and my team, we did a lot of work on, on, on Kubernetes and, and trying out different products. And it's, you know, it's always been a bit of a hassle to add one node to a cluster. Um, and this is where we, when we run into PKS. Um, for us, one of the key things was how can we do this management? How can we scale clusters? How can we spin them, spin them up very easily? And today, if we need one, um, you know, eight to 10 nodes, um, we can spin it up, go grab a coffee, and when you come back, it's running. Yeah. Um, and that was for us the key thing that you know, enabled to be able to deliver these clusters so fast creates a way around this namespace issue. Because of course, the benefit of a namespace is you push this YAML file and it's there. Right. Um, a cluster takes more time, so we wanted to find a way to reduce that time. Within the cluster, though, we will have our customers creating namespaces, yes. Mm -hmm. And they will use that to isolate lines of business in their company. Um, but that's, and then, then there the benefit of NSXT, which was nicely described already, is you can now create a NSXT environment and allow the customer to separate inside with namespaces, have that whole management automated as well. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we can isolate the traffic of each customer on, on the NSX backbone as well, nicely into different buckets, and they don't see each other, which for us is, is the key uh, thing yeah. we want to achieve. So it sounds like cluster management is a key part of the solution for you in terms of having that automated cluster, cluster management. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something that's often uh, kind of un underestimated. You know, there's all the buzz about Kubernetes, Kubernetes, but you know, ultimately Kubernetes requires a cluster underneath, and how you manage that cluster makes a real difference in terms of the manageability and the operations of the overall environment. Yes, so how about how about you? What's the, what's your thinking? I think you're probably looking at a little different perspective yeah. on clusters. Yes, we in our regular traditional environment we'll have like a dev staging and production server. So we carry the same format to the Kubernetes. So we will have a dev staging and production cluster, and then each application gets its own namespace. Okay. And then so and for secure and we do that for security reasons. Um, so we can control the uh, ingress based on those name and um, based on those namespaces. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And Jeff, what what are your thoughts around that? So today, our applications that we run within Kubernetes are our own applications. Mm -hmm. um, so we have we have our clusters set up per environment. So we have we have a production cluster. We have a, a non prod cluster. Um, future state, you know, depending on uh, the um, the application, or if we have a um, you know a customer that wants to um, run their run their workloads within our environment, um, we go and you know we have a uh, an acquisition um, onboarding those you know those new customers or. Um, uh, or companies, you know, that leads to the potential of um, spinning up, spinning up more Kubernetes clusters. Um, with PKS, it makes it very, very efficient and very easy to spin up, spin up new clusters. Yeah. So, how, how long does it take for you to, with your experience with open source Kubernetes and the container service that you built, you know, how long does it take to spin up a, a cluster, or to create a cluster, I should say? Um, well, so we have, we've developed a pipeline utilizing uh, VRO, um, we use Puppet, um, we use an open source uh, LDAP, um, so we've, we've automated the deployment of, of a virtual machine worker node, mm -hmm. um, which deploying one node probably takes about 15 to 20 minutes. 
um, and then it's handed over to our platform team that then has to do what they need to do to bring it into the uh, into the Kubernetes cluster. So just multiply that out times however many worker nodes that we have, and it, mm -hmm. it takes a it takes quite an effort to get a, an entire um, cluster stood up, and then yeah. and then you have to do all the um, you know the back end networking and um, NSX firewalls and, and and all those additional steps as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a pretty involved process. There's probably a fair bit of scripting, maybe things a little more brittle than you might like them to be. Um, so that, that brings us, I mean, I think to a, a, a good next topic, which is kind of day two operations, right? You know, once you get it deployed, you know, maintaining the cluster, how do you grow it? How do you, how do you shrink it? Um, so I'm curious, you know, how, how heavily did that factor into your thinking around Kubernetes and was that a, a, a decision factor for you? Nestor, you're smiling, so let's start with you. Well, the day two operations, um, we're, that's a problem we're still trying to solve. Okay. Um, but I'm sure VMware, as they have done in the past, will be right here helping us to solve the problem. As we do not have a, a, a solution for the day two operations, um, we know we have Bosch, which is, is great for the for like if your master nodes go, um, go down or something like that, but mm -hmm. for like protecting the, the VMs and, and stuff like that, our, um, we don't really have a solution, is it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, Stefan? Yeah, I want my question to the owners almost whoever updated their cluster here. Who has that experience? Anyone in the audience update their Kubernetes cluster? Okay, I, think I see some heads nodding. I think that's a question. Smiling. No, nobody ever tried, um, and there's a reason for it because it's a painful process. Yeah. And day two operations, um, you know, especially with vulnerabilities, patching, all these kind of things. Um, this is one reason why and you just mentioned Bosch. We're using Bosch for um, managing a lot of the infrastructure that we have also underneath Cloud Foundry. Uh, it is a, a tool out of that world, and, and the main reason to do that is because it allows us to very easily deploy new stem cells new versions of the VMs and, and start really structurally taking the old ones down, re, uh, bringing the new ones up. And, um, you know, just from that perspective, it, it, it offloads a lot of day two operations already and creates uh, um, a certain level of security by being able to react very fast. Mm -hmm. It, of course, requires a lot of discipline. And this is, this is a bit of the chance that we see if you talk about day two operations in Kubernetes, is that if people are using persistent storage on nodes, and we have to bring that node down, um, we get a couple of very angry customers that call mm -hmm. up like, where is my database? And of course you can explain them that they did something wrong, but still that doesn't make them happy. <laughs> um, so a lot of this is also about how is it being used, what is, what is you know, the, the vision and, and the deployment models that customers are using, and we are really trying to educate them on that point, that if you really want to benefit from data operations in these environments, you still need to apply a lot of these cloud native principles mm -hmm. that you might want to avoid. So the biggest challenge that we see is, in, is in not just in, in version, it's really in, in the way um, the nodes are being used by customers in terms of, and customers including our own developers, by the way, if we're mm -hmm. talking about that. Um, is, is, is misusing the local storage, persistent storage capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it harder to maintain the day two operations. If that is done properly, um, tooling can be pretty straightforward how to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the update cycle is pretty frequent with Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is you know, mm -hmm. nascent, evolving pretty rapidly, um, new minor releases every quarter. Uh, patch releases at least every two weeks, sometimes more frequently if there are vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and besides that, there's, there's a clear demand for people to stay on a certain version because they build their application and they're using features of that version. And if yeah. you upgrade them without you know, any uh, upfront notice, their application will break. Right. Um, so what we're seeing is not only the wish to be able to upgrade you know, easily, but also to maintain multiple versions of Kubernetes. Yeah. Which, is, to show. which is another you know, uh, great uh, driver for having independent clusters because the only way you can do that yeah. is to have an independent cluster. Exactly. That, so all in all, that was the reason for us to, to go for a, a cluster-based strategy. Um, ideally, and, you know, our end game will be container as a service. The ability that a customer can actually get one container as a service, pay for that, mm -hmm. and it will be dropped most likely in the namespace. And, and we need to find a way to secure that. But right now, with the state of Kubernetes and, and the technology around it, we do not see a at least econ economical viable way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jeff. Uh, so you talk about day two operations. Um, you know we have 
you talk about having an issue with a virtual machine, you know, within a within our um, you know open source Kubernetes deployment, you know, typically, you know, we get our QA folks or our developers that are um, you know the the app, something's wrong with the application, so you know we're having to sort of chase down where exactly, hey, where's that where's that microservice living, um, and then we you know after five, 10 minutes of doing troubleshooting, we figure out, oh, it's, it, we have a problem with one of the VMs. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's unresponsive. Um, so one of the great benefits of, of PKS is the ability for Bosch to recognize that a, um, a node is unresponsive and it'll, and then, you know, Kubernetes recognizes it first. It'll, you know, move the pods to a, to a, uh, to another node, and then Bosch will come on the backside and um, essentially spin up a new worker node, and then and then just kill off the uh, the dead one. Yeah, yeah. So that really speaks to the value of having a dedicated cluster manager. Um, and again, you know, Kubernetes is, you know, it's it's more than just Kubernetes uh, to make a container service and to have it uh, have it viable. All right, so let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's let's talk about uh, networking. So networking can be pretty complex in well in most environments, and and particularly in Kubernetes environments, you've got multiple overlays, and uh, you know diagnostics can sometimes be an issue. So Jeff, I'm curious, you know, having you you and your team have quite a bit of experience. Um, working with Weave and working with open source Kubernetes. So what, what sorts of issues have you run into on the networking side? Or has it all just gone smoothly? <laughs> uh, not so much. Okay. Um, so we have, with, with Weave, and it has its own VXLAN, like I mentioned earlier, we, we've also, we also use NSXV. Um, so we've got micro-segmentation at the VM level you throw Weave as the overlay network for, for containers, that has its own VXLAN. So any container to container communication happens across the Weave VXLAN, completely transparent to NSX. So we, we lose all that visibility mm -hmm. um, into the container to container traffic and you just kind of imagine, you know, the, uh, the developers just throwing out applications and um, you know, having containers speak to speak to each other that they're you know it's not supposed to happen. So um, you know that's that's obviously a, a challenge for us currently, and why we are heavily looking at um, at NSXT as as the uh, solution for um, for the overall networking um, for um, for Kubernetes. Okay. All right. Nesta, Stefan. Um. Let me just start by saying I'm not a network person, okay. so is, but the NSXT has made the uh, entire networking um, um, structure for Kubernetes transparent to us. We, you do your PKS, create a cluster, and your networking is good. You don't have to worry about anything else. And um, if you need to integrate with your outside network, your um, traditional VMs or physical servers, it's very easy to just go, to, go into the interface and, and add your rules and so forth. So we, because I'm guessing because we, we're not really in production as yet, we're not, we're not experiencing issues with, um, with the networking. But from what I'm seeing so far, I imagine it will be very easy. And we have experience with NSXV because we use it for, like Jeff, for micro-segmentation, mm -hmm. um, which, we, um, which helped us achieve PCI compliance last year. Yep. First in the Caribbean, I think. <laughs> I'm first in the yeah, Caribbean, Caribbean yeah, for yeah. PCI compliance. Yeah, and sure. um, I think <laughs> and one of one of the first. For yeah, sure. one of the first. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we have that experience, and from what I'm seeing so far, it will be um, much easier than what I've been doing so far. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, for us it was a part of a long journey with our previous SDN supplier, we, we were already on this way of thinking about how we can make containers be first class citizens on the network, um, mostly for, this, for the reason that you want to avoid that your container traffic is just a block of traffic coming out of something and then you need to figure out if you can trust it, yes or no. Um, when we started, when, when VMware came to us with NSXT and we were involved in very early stages even before we knew about PKS, so we were already looking at the product. Um, it became clear that 
the architecture and the ideas behind NSXT would be very appealing to us to work on and, and get container networking in place. And, and more or less in time, it, it came together with Kubernetes and later on uh, the PTS story that it, it really creates not only this automation of your networking, but also the isolation, the network segmentation, mm -hmm. the ability to say, hey, this group of containers can talk to this VM, uh, which is important for us because we really have these use cases of this is a, a couple of VMs running an SAP backend database. And then we have these container workloads that need to talk to that SAP mm -hmm. you want, uh, backend. And you want to make sure that in dev, it only can talk to dev and product can only talk to prod. Right. And now suddenly you have the tools to more or less automate this whole process and instead of having to build a whole bunch of firewall rules, um, with each deployment go back and, and check if this still is working. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can automate it more and more with, with modern tools, but um, still it requires a lot of upfront engineering to get this done right. And, and for us, this, this was the main reason why we got very interested in SXT, that we really saw that this container, although it, it, it runs in, it's a process inside the Linux kernel, um, and then it leverages the, all, the, all, the, all the stuff of different layers, but in the end you want to just get it on the same level from a management perspective. Yep. And that capability, that is key. Um, of course, as a source provider, we still have a couple of wishes around the product. Uh, it's not yet fully there. Um, um, but in general, the architecture and the way it's, 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 it's developing is exactly where we uh, envisioned it a couple of years ago. And, and and then this is the reason why we were very eager to get our hands on it yeah. at a very early stage. Yeah, that's great to hear. So let's, uh, let's find out what's on the audience's mind. So uh, let's open it up to, to questions. Uh, any, uh, any takers in the audience? Who's, go ahead. Do you mind coming on out to the, to the mic? Hello? Uh, yeah, I think that's working, go ahead. Cool. So my name is Ash, I work for British Telecom. We were talking about using VRO for automation, but I'd like to know if any of you consider it Ansible, both for your deployment and for uh, day two operations. And I'm not vested in this, I'm not like a secret lawyer or anything, I've just <laughs> got a particular interest in it. I'm sorry. I, so anyone using Ansible, or did uh, you investigate Ansible? Mm -hmm. I, I did. Okay. Yeah, we looked at different, a couple of different Kubernetes products, and without giving the names here on stage, but we looked at Ansible, and I think what we saw there is it, it still requires a lot of upfront thinking and definition, and you need to you know, fill out a lot of configuration forms. And again, there are CI CD tools, and you can automate that to a certain level. Um, we just based on our experience and, and the fact that we already were using Bosch at Cloud Foundry level, just felt that that model would, it, is more scalable for what we're doing and, and operating at a large scale. Um, and it's also a bit of a philosophical debate because what we see with Ansible and, and Puppet and these tools is that before you know, people get, you know, like to tweak every button that there is in. And then you get to a new version and then that button suddenly disappeared and you need to fix that. And, and we really try to you know, give people as little options as possible. Keep it standardized, keep it as close to what you want to have as possible and, and, and remove all these kind of tweaking around. Because before you know, your security team comes to you and wants that stuff, your networking team wants it. And just by eliminating that option, you, 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 you can just prevent a lot of you know, uh, um, issues with getting day two operations very efficient. And we have proven that in our Cloud Foundry experience that just doing this root upgrade of just removing the old version, get a new version that's safe, solves 99% of the problems that we encountered. So this is the reason why we onboard on the Bosch model of just, you know, just, you know more or less uh, fire and replace. That's, that's our strategy. So um, am I right in understanding it's a kind of an anti-snowflake kind of model, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. With your use of Bosch, do you have any particular tools that allow you to have infrastructure as code then? You mentioned Puppet, I believe, didn't you? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Sorry. Can, can we uh, have the volume raised on the front mic, please? So is that better? That's yeah. better. Thank yeah. you. So uh, with your use of Bosch, do you use any particular tools to allow you to have your infrastructure as code? You have, I believe you mentioned Puppet in particular. But... Um... No, we're just using the Bosch, uh, the plain Bosch management tools for okay. that. Um, we do use other tools, um, you know, pipeline tools like Concourse. Uh, we do use Puppet for uh, managing OSs that we want to have snowflakes for, or more like the pet approach instead of the kettle. Um, but anything that's related to cloud-native cattle, that's just using standard Bosch. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. 
You have a question in the back? Yeah. Um, do you guys currently have any Windows containers or, or any plans to adopt Windows containers with some of the new kernel features in 2016? I'm going to say potentially. I think we may have anywhere from maybe one to five potential candidates for, for Windows containers. Um, you know, in, in those type situations, I don't think there is a uh, uh, support for that within within PKS, and Paul can, can yeah. kind of speak to that a bit more. Yeah, not currently, um, and so it's not expected to go stable in uh, Kubernetes until 112, and uh, that's right around the corner. And so when we pick up uh, 112, we expect to have support for, uh, for Windows containers. Yeah, so currently we're not running any, any Windows containers right now. Yeah. And it's not something we're looking at at all. No Stefan, your environment? No, not that I know of right now. It's not on our agenda. We, the only thing that we have looked at is .NET support for containers. So more from a, the ability for developers to push this .NET code, but Ideally, developers should not care whether it runs on a Windows container or a Linux container. Yeah. That's the way we approach it right now. Yeah, I'm curious if we can have a show of hands in the audience, uh, either Windows containers or .NET. How many people are focused on on that to run on, on Kubernetes or containers? Okay, we got a we got a few. All right. That's what happens. All right. Other questions? Hi. Um, thanks for sharing your stories and stuff. Um, I had a question. We're also a Pivotal CF uh, user. Uh, we're looking at PKS, um, but we're also just looking at the overall container strategy uh, within Liberty Mutual. And one of the things that we're wondering, um, you know, obviously with the announcement today of maybe in the future you're going to support PKS on VMC, which was interesting, is part of the strategy of going with containers and all that is the workload mobility, right? For us, I don't know how the strategy of PKS maybe aligns with that. I mean, we're heavily right now kind of down the Docker path with the ability to kind of use that API layer to be able to instantiate anywhere, you know? And I'm just curious if there's any thought been put into that or any concerns about kind of when you go down the pivotal model, you know, you're kind of, you're not completely bound. I mean, Kubernetes is going to give you that. I'm just curious if there was any thought about that going forward of, you know, is it good just for on-prem now and that's what you wanted it for, for that experience? And had you thought about, you know, cloud mobility as well in, the, in your strategies? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we definitely uh, think a lot about cloud mobility. Um, and there are three uh, challenges that I'll say to, to cloud mobility. Um, one challenge is around uh, kind of API compatibility. Um, another challenge is around services, making sure that you've got common services across the different clouds that you might migrate to. Um, and the other challenge would be persistence, right? And ma making sure that, you know, it's the, the data problem. Um, and so we address the, uh, the API with, we, PKS has vanilla Kubernetes uh, and by design, um, that is a, a very clear intent of ours. And, uh, and we, one of the things that we tout is constant compatibility with GKE, but you know, we view GKE as a pure implementation of Kubernetes, and so kind of by extension, um, compatibility with any pure Kubernetes uh, distribution. And we're also, uh, we test the CNCF has uh, conformance, a set of Kubernetes conformance tests. Uh, we, we passed, we were part of the, uh, inaugural class of, uh, of conformant distributions and we continue to make sure that each release we're, we're conformant. So, so that addresses the API layer and so you should be able to go ahead and pick up and migrate an application from PKS on-prem to PKS in the public cloud to GKE to AKS or to any other you know vanilla Kubernetes distribution that's out there and so that I think is a very important part of it. Uh, the second piece is around services and how do we make sure that you have access to uh, the same set of services no matter when you or where you run your application. And so we do that with, uh, with service brokers and so we have support for open service broker, uh, we have support for 
uh, a Google uh, Cloud uh, Platform Service Broker as well that would allow you to uh, bind to services uh, that are off the platform and those services could be locally within your data center or they could be in uh, public cloud and that's uh, you know how we address that issue. Uh, the third issue, and just to be um, you know transparent, it's a little bit more difficult an issue in terms of data and, and migrating data, uh, particularly if you look at data charges. Um, but um, you know we're continued to uh, investigate um, uh, different approaches to it. Um, and you know that I think is you know probably the more significant challenge that we have going forward in terms of application mobility is how do you move the data, especially if you're talking about you know large quantities of, of data. Um, and we find that you know there is this kind of data gravity, and uh, folks tend to like to run the application where the, the the data resides. But you know that that may change over time as well with with various approaches. So. Uh, I, I hope that addresses your, your no, question. No, thank you. It was good. Thank you. Okay. Got a, another question? So, I'm brand new to containers, just doing some research. Uh, one of the th topics that I came across was data persistence. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that, or is that a need to handle that? Like, when once the container goes away, poof, it's gone, right? So, how do you address that? Or yeah. Well, it all depends, and you know, I'll turn to the, the team over here as well. But it depends on whether it's persistent or not. Stefan, go ahead. I actually just finished some work on, on looking into how do you do persistent storage on container level. Uh, and this is interesting because this is where a lot of people go you know, make big mistakes when they do a lift and shift scenario. They take their application, put it in Docker, and then shift it to, to Kubernetes and, and call their CEO and say, we're now in the cloud. <laughs> Congrats, you're not. Um, because that all has to do with, I think it was a, another speaker, another session saying the cloud is not a place, it's a concept. And part of that concept is you really think about what kind of data do you store where. Um, and if you're using, for instance, Docker and you make your Docker image, um, what is the stuff that you already store in your image, which will be you know, restored once you, you start over. And, and a nice example that I can give is uh, WordPress. We were deploying WordPress. And each time it got redeployed, it was back to the initial settings because somebody forgot to take the specific settings and, and bake it into the image. Well, welcome to the world of making Docker images. If you want to do something, you need to create them yourself. And if this is where you want your developers to spend time on, um, yeah, that's what they have to do. Um, the, the nice thing about Kubernetes is it gives you a lot of opportunities to automate that process with you know, key map values, with um, S3 buckets, or whatever storage technology to externalize that from your image. So a lot of the ability to really leverage the benefits of a platform, platforms like Kubernetes and, and for the likes of Cloud Foundry um, is about really architecting the way you use data in your application. So what is static, which you bake into your image or make it available, and what is dynamic? and, and you know, the rule that I will give to any developer is if it's dynamic, don't put it in your container. Unless it's like uh, uh, non-persistent, it's some status information that you can you know, lose and when you restart you don't need it anymore. But the minute you want to you wanna get anything dynamic data in there or store something that you need any other place, don't get it into your container. Don't store it on a node unless it is a persistent file system that spans across multiple nodes and, and survives. Not only container can die, but also a whole node can go you know, right. out of business um, and it replicates across multiple places. So you really need to think about it up front, how you want to do this. Uh, and this is, as I said, from a service provider perspective, one of our big challenges because we need to enforce these kind of things to our customers in a very polite way, but we need to enforce it in order to make sure we can manage it in a proper way. But what about uh, stateful sets, uh, stateful sets for in Kubernetes? Yeah, I, I still find it a bit of a contradiction. Okay. Why should you use them and not just use a VM? But yeah. That's almost a philosophical discussion. I, I, I've, we've looked at it. I, I, I think if then you're just using Kubernetes and uh, because you want to use Kubernetes. Mm. But you, you know, the beauty of Kubernetes is that it actually maintains those stateful sets. Um, but the, the question is, how do you want to make your storage stateful as well? Because mm. the, the container can still, for whatever reason, just die and gets resurrected, but it loses all the data that was you know, added to it after you created your image. So it's a relatively straightforward process. If it's static and you can bake it into your image, if you want to go through the burden of baking your own images, bake it in there. If, uh, if it's not static, make sure you store it somewhere outside and access it in the proper way. Right. Leveraging a service broker. And, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the service broker, but I don't okay. yeah. 
that's that's a great way of doing that and making it very dynamic. But there are, I mean, storage classes in Kubernetes, uh, persistent storage classes that allow you to even use NFS or whatever. Just make sure it's outside your container. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Scott Fulton from the new stack. Uh, Stefan, I was particularly interested. Uh, we, everybody, everybody said, hum, <laughs> la, 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 oh. Um. Uh, I was particularly interested in what you were saying uh, uh, about moving that .NET application out and, and uh, also having to deal with, uh, with in between with the overlays that had already been worked in, you think you said you'd already been using Weave. Uh, what were your challenges originally in getting that .NET architecture redone? Uh, effective, first of all, for your con containerized application, uh, but then as you decided to make that shift to PKS, uh, what uh, strategy shifts did you make along the way, uh, perhaps to make it easier on yourself? So, so we, uh, we I'm sorry. We're, uh, yeah, we. No, we'll Jeff, you had Weave, okay. right? <laughs> we had yes. We had. Okay. Uh, no, I'm getting it straight. We had uh, yes. .dot net and uh, and we're currently using Weave. So um, I think I mentioned this at you know towards the beginning of of, uh, of the talk here. So um, you know our, when you're working within um, .dot net, what we had was a .dot net. You know, front end, uh, you know, services and a SQL back end. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot that goes into the application itself. You're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code within, within that monolithic application. So it was very challenging for, for us to be very agile in getting new, um, new features. To uh, to the application um, and even doing hot fixes, it would essentially we're essentially replacing the entire .NET application. So we needed to make that we needed to make that shift, um, and we are refactoring all of those .NET applications um, into running as as microservices. So this you know this one you know the, this one application may now have um, you know, a few hundred pods, a few hundred microservices that make up the entire application. So did you have to make these changes in bits and starts, or did, it, did you just throw the switch all at once and... Uh, we would have loved to have been able to flip, we would have loved to have been able to throw the switch. So, you know, running running side-by-side -side environments, um, so our, you know, our legacy environment is, is uh, you know, it was always always up and running, and we we deployed out this new architecture running side by side, and you know it was a, it was a huge effort. You know, across the entire company, um, you know the the engineering team, platform team, developers, um, you know the, uh, the the C level folks, the the different business units to to really understand um, how we wanted to refactor. This application into this new platform. So a lot of folks were involved um, in in this redesign. It wasn't so much a, a redesign of the application because it still has the same core feature functionality. Um, we we have thrown in a lot of new um, functionality to it, um, but leveraging uh, uh, various um, distributed database systems as well. Getting away from SQL, where you have the inherent you know, locking and blocking and long running queries that are, you know, consuming resources, um, moving to these distributed database platforms where you, you don't have that anymore. So the application itself is just that much faster and more responsive. Um, being able to, you know, deploy, deploy microservices or containers pretty much any time during the day. You know, not having to wait until, you know, 10 o'clock at night to, to just deploy out a hotfix. You know, now in, our, in this new architecture, you know, we can deploy out a, a hotfix or a new feature during the middle of the day, and it's uh, seamless to the, to the end user. Are there any architectural sh shifts that PKS has had you make that made things easier for you than you would have had otherwise? 
Well, so um, we are in the evaluation stage of, of PKS. So um, I would say, you know, PKS from more of the day two operations. It's really not from a, from an application standpoint because it's 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 Kubernetes. You just you know you provide the Kubernetes API to deploy the the containers out to it. It's really the operational state of, of PKS with um, you know with Bosch with the integration into NSXT that really gives you that that holistic um, you know simplicity that that you know you're really looking for within within the infrastructure and really not you know you get to a point with with PKS where you really don't care about virtual machines anymore because Bosch takes care of it. Maybe also adding to that, I think. What you're describing is more or less the road towards microservices, and if you're going down that road, you should be technology agnostic anyway. Um, so when we started that years ago, um, we focused more on the application architecture, on how do you divide, you know, divide it up, slice it up, the, you know, the large application, slice up the smaller parts, and that's exactly what you described into independent microservices that communicated with each other. Um, whether or not you run that on PKS or even on Cloud Foundry or on VMs, that doesn't really matter because it's, it's about how you have architecture application. Uh, in all fairness, Kubernetes makes it easy because we associate microservices and containers with each, each other because of the scalability of it. Um, but you can build a perfect microservice based on a mainframe application. There's no reason why you can't. Um, it's just probably harder to run it on a container. Um, so, so what we saw is that it doesn't change the strategy in which you, depl uh, you develop your application. That is really all about running in microservices, applying these cloud-native principles. Um, fully agreeing what we were just saying, PKS just makes the day two operations and keeping it up and running way easier than what we have seen so far with other solutions. Thank you, John. Okay, we're, uh, we're, we're nearing the end, so just uh, closing remarks. I'd like to know from you gentlemen if you have any, uh, any closing tips for others that are going to embark on their uh, container journey. Nesta, you want to start? <laughs> um, or shall we come back to you? No, I can start. The Kubernetes is, is Kubernetes. You can deploy it um, in your existing infra infrastructure. But as your, everybody has mentioned before, day two is very important. So you need a cluster manager. So I recommend people look at DKs. At, at least. Okay, cluster manager being very, very important. important yeah. So make sure that's part of your solution. Yeah, I don't want to give yourself more work by trying to get rid of more work. <laughs> so. I'm sorry? I say you don't want to give yourself more work when trying to get rid of more work. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think first of all, fully agreeing with the day two part. Um, also, do not underestimate the impact of root networking. Um, Especially on that side, if you talk to the guys that develop Kubernetes, they will be the first to admit that they underestimated what it means to run it from a networking perspective. Um, what are the you know the hoops you have to jump through? I mean, having four layers of netting is just simply not ideal. It's performance-wise not ideal, but it's also security-wise not ideal. So I would really also think really wisely about how you set up your networking there. Whatever technology you're going to choose, I mean, PKS, of course, NSXT, but there are... Feel free to evaluate any other option, but really think about it and think it through before you start and do not run into the wall uh, at some point and have to start all over again. It's yep. good advice. Yeah. So Stefan, Stefan stole a bit of my thunder with the networking <laughs> piece of it, but um, I, I think my, uh, my advice would be um, you know, to make sure that you've got all your, all your um, different IT teams that are working together, um, developers, um, infrastructure folks, networking folks, and, and security folks that all understand um, what this what this architecture looks like. Um, you know, from an NSXT standpoint, you know it's not it's not as easy as just installing it within you know your your uh, your virtualized environment. There's a lot of, of back end networking that that goes into it and and making it operate efficiently um, on the physical network itself. Great, thanks. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you for sharing your experiences uh, with the, the audience here. And audience, thank you very much for attending. Really appreciate it. Hope you uh, have a great rest of the show. Uh, there's lots of other uh, container and PKS-oriented sessions. Uh, please come by and, and visit. Thank you very much.